Thank you, Dick, and thank you, everybody, for coming and then uh, to do our lesson. Um, the topic for the week is uh, desire of nations. Desire of nations. What is it? And I think about it. What is it that everybody, regardless of nationality, desires? We all want what? Salvation. Regardless of you are from here or from there or from there. Even regardless of your religious belief. You are Muslim. You are Hindu. You are... We all want one thing, salvation. So that being the case, our lesson is very simple. What is the source of who? This salvation. What is the source? How do we get this salvation regardless of your nationality, regardless of your yeah, language, regardless of your religious origin. The lesson tells us what? There's only one source. You have to come to him to get it. One source. It's not king of the kings. It's not the royal family. It's not the US presidency. You know, the highest offices in the world will not give you that Salvation. Only one person can do it. Oh, um, Dick, I think you're, you're partially right, though. It's not that we have to come to him. Mm -mm. He comes to us. He comes to us. And uh, you're right. The way you are right is when he does come to us, then we do, have a decision. Do we accept him? He's knocking on the door. We have mm -hmm. to open it. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, why, why is it not that any more simple? We try to make it way more complicated than that. Um, I think we, ha we have fears that, uh, that Satan's implanted in the human mind about God. Mm -hmm. And in those fears, just like Adam and Eve, when he approaches, we want to hide because we don't feel we're worthy. Exactly. Or for some reason. But it's all, it's all Satan implanting these lies. He did it to Adam and Eve. We, we don't see that conversation. But they hid because Satan told them, I guarantee he's, you know, your punishment's coming. And those fears caused them to hide from their creator that they loved. He comes today. He wants he's, us. He's offering he wants us. salvation. Yes. And it really is as simple as opening the door. Yeah. Sin, sin is what separates us from him. That's what the lesson says. Yeah. He comes to you. He comes to you. He comes to me. Are we willing to receive him? No, because what? There is this bridge. There's this gap. There's this block called who? Sin. Sin takes us, sends us back. Not that, you know, the lesson talked about that, that it's not that God does not like or love a sinful person. No. It is a sinful person that is doing what? Running away. Indulging in his sinful ways. And does not have that confidence. Does not have that belief. Does not have that faith that Christ, God, can give him salvation. Let me read the memory test. And tell you what I think about it. Memory test, which is on Isaiah 16, verse 3. The Gentiles shall come to our light, and kings to the brightness of your rising. Mm -hmm. When I look at the book of Isaiah from the first to the end, to where we are today on chapter 16, the way I appreciated it, and I would like you to see that way, 
Look at Isaiah's messages in real time. In today, not that he is prophesizing to the Israelites or the Jews of 2,000 years ago. No. If you look at today, there is what? Babylon. If you look at today, there are these kings that do not respect, have faith in God. They are still there. So everything that Isaiah prophesied about then are still there today. Amen. Then another thing is looking at things in real time, in today's time, is also look at our, our lesson says desire of nations. It did not tell you desire of the Jews, desire of the Arabs, the desire of the Caucasian. No. Desire of what? Nations. Let's look at this because it says the Gentiles. That says what? Everybody. That whatever Isaiah was saying applied to who? Everybody. Yeah. Regardless. So when you say uh, Gentiles, Jews, don't forget Abraham. That when God picked him up, he made him what? Father of who? All. So it's an inclusive thing. There's no exclusion. So since it's inclusive, what does it say? That everything we are doing, everything we are studying, everything we want to appreciate, our faithfulness is all what? Universal. It's not where that Isaiah was talking to potential Adventists in the 2020s, no. Isaiah was talking to everybody. You are Adventists, you are Assemblies, you are Methodists, you are everybody. Isaiah is talking to you. That's right. And our wish, our desire is what? Salvation. Look up to that salvation. And you can only get that by what? Faith. Faith. Not that work is irrelevant. You know, I will not sit here and tell you, though, no, it's bad to work, it's hard, it's bad for you to be um, a very um, hard working, evangelistic Adventist. No, I'm not telling you that. That you are doing is a manifestation of who? Of your faith. If I can get up in the morning, come here, all of you are here this morning. Not that you don't have a stores or your children to take care of, or we have the church here to clean, their school work to be done, you come to donate your time. Those are work. But if you do all that and there is no faith, then what is salvation? What is salvation? Because at the end, you're going to say, oh, I was there in any church meeting. I was there in offering my tithes. I was there in doing this and doing that. Oh, yes, that is work. Why are you doing that work? Because you have what? Faith. faith. Yeah. Just, just, we just need to keep in mind, Godwin, that faith without the works, what are we told? Faith without the works is dead. It's nothing. So it's not that works aren't important. Mm -mm. But there are results of our faith. Of that that's result what, of our faith. That's what we. That's what is. It's just a normal <laughs> outcome. Well, and, and because it's a result of our faith, works in and of themselves have nothing to do with our salvation. They no, have to no. do with the salvation of others <laughs> yeah. as we shine our light. Mm -hmm. right. But our salvation comes from Jesus alone, that's right. and what He does. His righteousness. What He does in us. His righteousness. Mm -hmm. I think there are many people that, like God was in, in, in hinting at, that do a lot of things thinking these things are tied to their salvation or the lack of their salvation. One or the other. They're either trying to stay saved or get saved through behaviors. Yeah. Right. And there's no truth in that whatsoever. No, and, and the fact that the thief on the cross, how, how much time did the thief on the cross have to do any works? 
Think about that. Mm -hmm. That was instantaneous. But, but he just look, looked over at him and said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. kingdom. And Jesus said, I'll tell you today, because you believe, he didn't say that, but but, because you believe, you'll but, be there. But that one work of, of, of proclaiming that, look at the impact it's had in yeah. life yeah. on an untold number, untold of, people number of people because right. that story has been told. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. yeah, so let's go uh, to the introduction in our lesson. One thing I picked up there, remember we've agreed that one of the desires, if not the desire of nations, is salvation. But look at what the introduction of our lesson says. His prophet, the Lord promises through his prophet, let the wicked forsake who? His right. way. Mm -hmm. And the unrighteous man, his thoughts, let him return to the Lord, and he will have mercy upon him and to our God, for he will abundantly do what? Pardon us. What is he saying here? We cannot claim sinless. We cannot claim that. But if we ask for forgiveness of our sins, if we take the sin away and accept the offer to come to Christ, that we will be what? We will be pardoned. Mm -hmm. Isn't that good? I get a traffic ticket. Mm -hmm. I go to court. I plead to the judge. Look at my circumstances. Look at my circumstances. He looked up, he looks down. You can go. Mm. The ticket is thrown away. Mm. What do you do? You'll be happy yeah, for that thank moment. You. Thank you. Mm. So when somebody says, yes, I understand. You live in a sinful world. My son came here. we seen all over the place. He lived through it. And he did what? He died for mm. your own sin. He died for your own sin. Not his own sin. No. He died for your own sin. Mm -hmm. Then, for that, you have been what? Forgiven. Yes. Your sins are washed away. Yes. Now, you can come and do what? Embrace the salvation. As long as you do what? Have faith. Yeah, for everyone who accepts it. You accept yeah. it. You accept it. So, it's very simple. So, what we are talking about was what is um, on a Sunday lesson, the effect of sin. We have pretty much discussed that. The effect of sin. So, in Isaiah 58, 3, the people ask God, why do we fast? But you not see. Why humble ourselves? but you do not notice. In contrast, Isaiah 59 implies another question, something like, why do we call the Lord hand to save us, but he does not? Why do we cry to him, but he does not? Isaiah answers this, that God is able to do what? To save and to hear. Well, I, I, I think it's not only he's able, he will. Mm -hmm. Our expectations are not realistic. Exactly. Um, if they were realistic, it would happen because he does everything that is good for us. Mm -hmm. uh, he doesn't withhold anything. Yeah. Um, you know, you got to go back to Job over and over and over. Job is such an important <coughs> story. Uh, in this because we're told that Job basically did nothing wrong. He didn't understand the whole picture because God had a pretty good conversation with him at the end explaining, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. you don't understand what's been going on. You weren't here when all this was made, you know, but yet his mercy and his love vanquished the enemy in the end. I think I look at that, the, the human nature in us. I do that sometimes. Last year, July, two of my brothers died four days apart. Yes, yes. Two of my brothers. Now, 
the, the burden of sending their bodies back to Nigeria was on me. Mm. The burden of paying for the funeral home that kept them from that July to November was on me, two of them. Right. So you will go back as human and say, why me? Mm. As religious, as hardworking, as I am, how come that the person who doesn't even know the road to the church, don't even know what the Sabbath is, not, mm. okay, not say Sabbath, just go to any church, mm. go worship with anybody, mm. go pray with anybody. Don't go through all this, why mm. me? Mm. But for the fact that you study things like this, mm. you have these lessons, it cleans your mind up and say what? God knows what he is doing at any time. That's right. All the time. All the time. He knows. So therefore, don't give up. Don't say, oh, I'm not going to pray again. I'm not going to ask again. No. Knock on the door. It will be open for you. You know, I'm back to who I am. I have accepted that... Everything that happened last year was the wish of God. And to tell you the worst of all, the worst of all, when I was trying to go to Nigeria, I had my flight the first time around. I got sick myself. I got sick. So I was sick. When I started to recover, they said I should go and get a COVID test. Now, if you get the COVID test, you have to wait for three days to get your result. Mm. So all those delayed the trip. I did not travel when I was supposed to travel. When I eventually traveled, I had just one week mm. to go there and come back. Mm. But did I give up? Say, oh no, why am I going through this torture? Why am I going through this punishment? Mm. That I don't believe, I still believe. I still have faith. Amen. And then I still want to do the work that my faith is being manifested. Amen. Still want to do it. So our lesson this morning is calling us to that. Mm. Do not, do not allow sin, knowingly or unknowingly, to create a block between you mm -hmm. and your God. Exactly. So that well, and and it's not the it. actions of sin that does that. It's the love of sin that does that. Hmm. When, when, when our hearts love sin, that's when it pushes Jesus out. Now, that, the author at the end of this, at the end of that day, at the end of Sunday, uh, no, he says, do, do, do not mm -hmm. tolerate sin in your life. No. Well, you know? Let me read these two short paragraphs here uh, um, in the Spirit of Prophecy. It says, while true faith rests wholly on Christ for salvation... It will lead to perfect conformity to the law of God. Faith is manifested by works. And down a couple of paragraphs, it says, The simple experience of accepting salvation by faith seems to many to be too easy. And uncounted numbers who claim to be following Christ virtually take the position that salvation is partly by faith in Christ's death on Calvary and partly by human effort. Mm -hmm. people, uh, many people, I, I've, I've been in that point at some, you know, at certain points where I felt that way. Mm -hmm. But that's not true. Mm -hmm. um, the human effort has nothing to do with our salvation. Mm -hmm. um, it's, uh, the human effort is, uh, as we see, filthy rags, is it not? Yeah. Salvation um, is the gift. It's a gift. But then <laughs> it says that once we accept that gift, it will lead to conformity. Cool. It's not that we have to work to be conformed, it leads us to that. It, it, it is something that God does in us also. Mm -hmm. Amen. It's, and that's the truth, Rob. It's, it's all him, isn't it? Mm -hmm. It really right. is. Salvation mm -hmm. is all mm -hmm. him. I mean, can you imagine the idea that what I do is better than what he did? <laughs> <laughs> or, or better than what somebody else does? Or makes us more acceptable, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know? No. Satan, when we, when we believe that, or when people believe that, Satan must 
chuckle in his heart at how that, that lie has, got, has been ingrained. And it, it, and it is such a insidious lie because if you don't really think about it, it almost seems like that must be the way it is. Mm -hmm. You know, yeah, because, yeah. because there, it seems like to many people that there's an adversarial relationship going on between Jesus and the Father. Mm. And Jesus is arguing, but what we do is a tipping point that gets the argument over the thing. And Job, like I said before, opens that whole stuff up and shows that is not the truth, that there's an adversary called the devil that is accusing us before the Father, it says, day and night, and God gave his son that we may be saved. Amen. Jesus gave himself that we may be saved. Mm -hmm. They are not adversaries. Mm -mm. They are united mm -hmm. against the accuser. Yeah, so in the lesson it says, um, not that God ignores us. God chooses to ignore us, his people, not because that is his desire, but because your iniquities, our iniquities have been barriers between us and our God. Mm -hmm. That's what the lesson says. We come here to say, Sin is primarily a rejection of God, a turning away from him. The sin not actually feeds upon itself in that not only is the act a turning away from God, but also the result of the act causes the sinner to do what? Turn away even more than the Lord himself. Sin separates us from God, not because God wouldn't reach out to the sinner. Mm -hmm. So that's what we are saying in this Sunday part, that the impediment to the salvation we are seeking is through sin. If we can repent, confess our sins, accept Christ that he has shed his blood for our sins, mm. that impediment will be moved mm. and then will be pardoned. Things will happen to us as God wants it to, 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 to happen. Mm. So, talking about sin, and say there will be pardon. Who can be pardoned? Whose sin is pardonable? Is there any sin that cannot be pardoned? Well, you know, I, I, I think most of my Christian life I misunderstood this because <clears throat> Jesus said on the cross, forgive them for they know not what they do. I believe that was a broad, in a way, uh, that, that was for all people of all times. He says he died for the sins of the whole world. Um, we, I did not understand the true connection of what it took to be saved. Being forgiven is half of it. We see in the prayer. And that occurred at the cross. I believe all names were written in the book of life at the cross. Now, that doesn't guarantee that you're saved because there's a second part of that. You know, we give it big names, justification and sanctification. But the second part is the cleansing part, is when we have to allow him in to change us. The forgiving, he did. He offers that as a gift. Mm -hmm. yep. But yep. we, ha in order to be changed, and this is part of the love of God, he will not impose himself on someone that doesn't want him. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. He will not change someone that doesn't want it. Mm -mm. Mm -mm. But if we ask for it and want it, he says, I forgive and I can change you. I can make you new. Amen. And mm -hmm. all you have to do is allow me to do it. That changing, the, the um, 
confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It's two parts, forgiving and cleansing. Forgiving is done. Mm -hmm. Cleansing re requires our mm -hmm. acceptance mm -hmm. and allowing him in. That's the part, the yeah. only part that we play in it is, is basically opening the door and saying, come do it. Cleanse me. And we have to do that every day. Paul says, I die daily. That's that, opening the door yeah. every day to, to, to allow him in to work on us. Um, but it is important, and this is why he draws all men to himself, that the forgiveness part is already there. We don't have to beg to be forgiven. We have to beg that he cleanse us. Absolutely. We have to mm -hmm. repent and want that change. To be changed, yeah. Mm -hmm. But yeah. to know that he already forgave. It's like, it's like the, the, the prodigal son. When he came back to the father, when he was afar off, had the father already forgiven him? Sure. Already done. Already mm -hmm. done. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, that's why the father ran to him. Yeah. Um, did he come and confess? I've, I've been wronged? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. And the father put the robe on him and, you know, killed the fatted calf and all this stuff. But, you know, it, it's important to understand the love of God at the cross was manifested in a way that solves the entire problem. All we have to do is open the door. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Accept and, and like you said, Rob, be willing to be changed. Well, that's, you know, that's, I think that's what the opening the door means. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah all of us understand. Uh, I think all of mankind actually understands our, our, uh, our badness mm. and our goodness and our bad goodness. <laughs> I think we know in our heart of hearts, mm. most of us know we're not, we're not very Christ-like. Exactly. But that's our aspiration. Though. Yeah. Yes, that's, that is, that's what we aspire to. Mm -hmm. And that's what he offers, mm -hmm. is to become like him. Mm -hmm. By beholding, we become changed, mm -hmm. right? That's why we study these lessons. That's, that's right. So, so, so um, the lesson says, this question can be seen. How many of us have sinned? We've already answered that. All of us. How many of us have sinned? It says, the Bible is unequivocal. All of us have. Redemption, therefore, cannot be based on lack of sin. Cannot be based on lack of sin. It must be based on who? What Bob just said? Forgiveness. Forgiveness and cleansing. Forgiveness. So we we'll go for them. Which, which I think the beautiful part of this, and right behind you is a picture that somebody's put up, you know, of the cross and all this stuff. That, oh, yeah. um, oh, okay. Repentance doesn't come first. Forgiveness does. Repentance mm. comes as a natural, when we see that cross, we get on our knees and repent because we recognize how sinful we are and how we're responsible just as though the people that actually drove the nails in. And that, that drives us to repentance. If it doesn't, we're going to be the ones yelling, crucify him, are we not? Mm-hmm. So the purpose of the law, the purpose of the law in a sinful world isn't to save, but to point out to sin. It's not to save you from the sin, but to point out the sin. So instead, faith that we've been talking about, faith, walking through love, love that is poured into the heart by God demonstrates that a person has living faith in Jesus. We've discussed this a whole lot. At the bottom line is what? Desire to have salvation. Salvation we are going to get by faith. Not the words. We put the law into it. Where someone says, oh, I obeyed all the Ten Commandments. What is he doing? Directing you. It's not going to forgive you your sins. It's going to do what? Point out where you have gone wrong so that 
you can make amends and then receive that the desire, which is salvation. Well, and of course, the summation of the law is loving God and other people. So in reality, it, it's pointing out where your love has been weakened or destroyed. That we, we, we need him, and he can only restore that. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, it's easy as we try to make behavior part of the equation. We make, you better do this, you better not do this, and all this stuff. Mm -hmm. But yet we don't look inward to the heart that draws us to want to do those things. And it's the broken relationship is what God's about. And fixing all broken relationships. Um, and that, that is, is what the cleansing in our hearts is all about. It's so that pride doesn't rise up and make me feel I'm better than you. I mean, saying we're all sinners completely destroys that playing field of one person's sin is worse than another or better than another because we're all on equal ground when it comes to without Jesus, we're condemned. And we're all on equal ground that with him, we are all offered salvation. So back to the lesson, it says, works are outward expression, the human manifestation of his seven faith. Work is manifestation of your faith. We've uh, discussed that a lot. Hence, a true Christian experience is one in which faith is expressed in a daily commitment to the Lord that is revealed by obedience to the law. In the judgment, God uses works as evidence for his creations who cannot read thoughts of faith as he can. But for the converted person, only works following what? Conversion. When the life is empowered by Christ and the Holy Spirit, are relevant in the judgment. Summarizes what we've been saying all along. The importance of who? Faith. Work is manifestation. It's, it's, it's an outward expression of the faith that you have. So on Tuesday, once again, in our overview, we talked about this, where I said, that the, and we say nations, you appreciate Isaiah more if you look at it in real time and globally, instead of Isaiah was prophesizing to the Jews and more or less, you are studying Isaiah, you are studying the history of the Jews. No, look at it in real time. Look at it in today's world. So, this appeal for us to have faith, use work to manifest our faith, is an appeal to who? Everybody. Everyone. Yes. Universal appeal. Universal appeal. Global appeal. It's not appeal to any one group of, of people. So in Isaiah 60, we are given a picture of God's deliverance of his people following the exile, expressed with the imagery of God's creating light out of darkness and pointing forward to an ultimate fulfillment in salvation through Christ. Change that and look at it in real time. In today's world, what is going on around us? And then, this Isaiah's prophecy, how are they fulfilled in your own personal life, in the life of your community, in the life in your country, and who? Worldwide. You can see that the prophecy Isaiah had at that time is true. 
today. 2,000 of years have passed. But what Isaiah was saying is still true today. Amen. What Isaiah told those Jews that time to do, hey, don't abandon your creator. Have faith that he will save you. Otherwise, those kings out there that do not believe in God will come and do what? Conquer you. That's what Isaiah said then. Isn't that true today? If you don't have faith that God is there behind you in everything you are doing in your life, place of work, when you go in, when you come out, the devil out there, devil is always there, yeah. will come and do what? Conquer you. He will allow the devil to conquer you. Probably now you learn from who? From your mistakes. That's right. Hopefully. Hopefully. Yeah. Regrettably. Yeah. So that's yeah. what Isaiah was saying to the people. Then, that we are saying now, it applies to who? All of us. It's a universal appeal he made then, and that appeal is applicable in today's world, in today's livelihood, in today's relationship, in your family, with your friends, in your country, yeah. and then globally. Back then, it's the same as it was today, as it is today. Going to be and tomorrow. We, I mean, we're not in this alone, even mm -hmm. though we, mm -hmm. as Seventh-day Adventists, think of ourselves as being the remnant mm -hmm. church. Okay, we're not alone in this, the, the same thing that, he, that Isaiah was telling his people at, his, at that time, yeah. okay? Yeah. We have, have the power of the Spirit to go with us. Yeah, because there are some uh, religions or some churches or Christians you see, they say, oh, that is in the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. That is an Old Testament issue. You Seventh-day Adventists are related to it because you believe in the Old Testament. There are some people that don't even know that yeah. we read the New Testament. Yeah. They're surprised. I brought some friends to church with me, and our preacher will be preaching from the New Testament. We'll go home and say, I didn't know you already the New Testament. Mm -hmm. So you don't? Mm -hmm. What do you think we do? <laughs> well, they also, most of them believe that the God of the Old Testament was not the same God of the New Testament. They mm -hmm. believe that... There was a father that was stern in the Old Testament, and the New Testament is Jesus, and they're, they're adversaries with one another. Jesus is the God of the Old Testament. Mm -hmm. Jesus is the he God believed, of the New Testament. Very clear. John 1, in the beginning was the Word. Mm -hmm. And then, in, I can't remember the exact verse number, but, you know, that rock that followed them, that pillar of fire that followed them, was Christ. Mm -hmm. it, it, I mean, the New Testament very plainly points out, it was always Jesus. Yeah, the lesson reads, Isaiah himself, I say, develops the theme that introduced in verse 1 to 3, Isaiah 61 to 3. It says, the people of the world are drawn to Jerusalem. This case now, um, I don't want us to think of physical Jerusalem hmm. in the Mediterranean. But looking at the spiritual, the God's Jerusalem that we are aspiring for. Because if you think about the physical Jerusalem, then you'll be thinking, okay, the Jews, they have done this, done that, done that. That what to be called Jerusalem. No. Jerusalem here now is who? Christ himself. Mm -hmm. It's symbolic. Mm -hmm. Christ is the Jerusalem. That, so that being the case. Well, I mean, going back to what the word Jerusalem means, I think is very important. It goes back to Salem, Jerusalem. But the, the root meaning is the city of peace. Mm -hmm. The new Jerusalem is God's Jesus as the, the king of it. It is his city of peace. It's not this place on this earth. Mm -mm. It is what he's building for us. And we'll bring down. Yeah. Who is an embodiment of peace? Jesus. Christ. Who? Who is an embodiment of peace? Who is an embodiment of love, kindness, hospitality? It's not you. It's not me. 
Jesus himself. No, it's only Jesus. Amen. There's no city in this world. I've been to most of the capital cities. Mm. I've been to Jerusalem. Mm. I've been to, I mean, I've, I've been to Sydney, Australia. I did not see where we go there, you will get love everywhere. No, <laughs> it does not exist. That's a euphoria. Mm. The only person you will go to that has peace and will transform you to have peace, to have love, to have kindness, to have rest of mind, is only who? Jesus. Amen. Mm -hmm. It's only Jesus. That's oh, what the lesson is. And not to. only can he do that, he promises he will if you ask for it. Yeah. It's, not a, it's not just a possibility, it's a guarantee. And, and actually, that's not all. When you think about it, he also said that the same Jesus who has begun a good work in you okay. will perform mm. it or will finish it. Will finish it. Okay. So our lesson uh, says that um, on this universal thing, God had a universal purpose when he chose Abraham yeah. and his descendants. Through Abraham, all families of the earth will be what? Will be blessed. Mm. This is in Genesis, the first book of the Bible. So, God's covenant with Abraham was ultimately intended to be a covenant with all humankind through Abraham. He and his descendants will be God's channel of revelation to the world. What are we talking about? It has been established. Yeah. That we are all yeah. sons and daughters of who? The God. Covenant. The covenant, the covenant is for all covenant. of us. Yeah. The covenant is an agreement <laughs> that we root. We have agreed. You and I got our attorney to sign it. That this is how we are going to behave. This is how we are going to execute this business. Why would God write a covenant for us, with us? And we turn around, abandon it, renege on this covenant. Our own part of it, we do not. But he's trying to remind us in this lesson that he did not just write this covenant with the Jews of thousands and thousands of years, but through his son Abraham, this covenant is between him and who? Everybody. Well, I think Dwight Nelson's been, for the last few weeks, making a really strong point. It's so simple. The maker of all things loves and wants me. Mm -hmm. Yes. It is. Yeah. That's the only reason he made the covenant. Yeah. He didn't need to. He didn't have to. He, want, he loves me, you, everyone, and he wants you, me, everyone, to be with him in heaven. Okay. That, that, I mean, it, 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 we try to make it complicated and arbitrary and that, that, that you know, that, he, that he's doing all he can to weed out and get rid of the ones that aren't, you know, worthy and all this. No. Yeah, he truth. wants every single person yeah, the truth to is be in heaven. He's not mm -hmm. worried about weeding out. He's worried about letting in. He wants everybody to come in. There's room there for everybody. And that is only and that is room. And that is because he loves everyone. Mm -hmm. And it hurts him whenever someone rejects him and doesn't you know accept the gift and, and doesn't get salvation. Yeah. It hurts him because he loves them. Mm -hmm. It's not arbitrary. I mean we look individually at the people we know your brothers and so forth. Yeah. When, when we lose someone, we understand a tiny bit of the pain that God feels when he loses someone. Yeah. But yeah. we have hope because of Jesus that this is not permanent. That's right. So we've never experienced what God's going to experience when it comes to those mm -hmm. losses. Mm -hmm. But we can have a, a touch in our hearts of what that must be like for someone that loves. When we lose something we love. 
And, and that's why and we can understand the drive he has then to not lose that what he loves. Yeah. So then the, on Wednesday, the lesson is asking, did God partition in chronological order what year or years that he will show favor? It says the year of Lord's favor. Is it what the way God oppress? To say, oh, in 2021, there will be favor. In 2020, oh, no, there will be no favor. Well, the whole world will be infected with the pandemic. No. That's not the way he oppressed. So the lesson says, the spirit of God is on this anointed person, mm -hmm. which means that he is a messiah or the Messiah, he is to bring good news to the oppressed, to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and release to the prisoners. Whom does that sound like to you? Sounds like Jesus to me. That sounds like Jesus. <laughs> then the Jesus that was there yesterday is there today, will be, be there, there tomorrow. tomorrow. Amen. What does that tell you? All the time, all the places that the Lord will do it, will be there with you. And he says when these bad things happen, don't focus on the bad things. What you say? Look up. Mm -hmm. For your redemption is near. It's all the time, mm -hmm. yeah. If you have faith, it will be there. You may see yourself. Oh, I have no job. How am I going to eat tomorrow? I have no money. How am I going to pay? No. What? You have faith. I use myself for stories sometimes, and it sounds funny. When I was in graduate school in North Carolina, there was a day. Then I just got married. Imagine somebody just be married for one year. You don't even... I was bending on graduate stipend. Good at thing that time. When you are doing PhD, you don't have to pay dues. They give you a little stipend of uh, two, three hundred dollars a month. That's all I had. But I ran out of the money. Now, I wanted to go from Greenville, North Carolina, where I was in school, to go back to Raleigh, where my brother was staying, to see if I would get some money. But I didn't have gas. That's where having faith means a lot. <laughs> so I said, okay, let me go check our mail first. Yeah. I went to check our mail. From nowhere, from nowhere, believe this, from nowhere, I had a shell card, gas card <laughs> in the mail. <laughs> I did not apply uh -huh. for one. <laughs> a shell gas card came in the mail. That I opened it up, I saw it. I called Gloria, can you believe this? <laughs> now, with this card, you can go there and buy gas $10 and tell them to give you another 10 But I didn't do that. All I did was to do what? Go pump the gas so that I can go back to Raleigh and meet my brother, the one who just passed away. Oh. He was living in Raleigh, North Carolina at that time. So I went back there. Huh. Okay. So when I came back, I got a little money to sustain us until the next uh, pay period. Amen. What am I saying there? That even when it looks like you have to give up hope, yeah. that hope comes from somewhere. The help comes from somewhere. So, my dear brothers and sisters, God does not choose what time, what place to come for your salvation. Only have what? Have faith. Mm, amen. That will be there. Have faith, and then it helps. So in the interest of time, let's uh, just look at, because this looks contradictory. When you look at a God of favor and the God of vengeance, you say, whoo, what are we looking at here? So there is a time. This God that shows us favor, shows us love, shows us kindness, is going to have what? Vengeance. Vengeance doesn't look good yeah, when you talk about it. Yeah, let's make sure we're on the right side. Okay. <laughs> so exactly, you'll be on the right side. 
So it says, though Jesus has told us to turn the other cheek elsewhere, he is very clear that justice and punishment will be meted out. Though Paul tells us not to render evil for evil, he also says that when the Lord is revealed from heaven with flaming fire, he will take vengeance on them that know not God. Yeah, what are we talking heck. about? It? On those that don't know God. If we finish studying these lessons today, don't forget, Sabbath school lesson is not preaching. Hmm. Okay? We are together looking at what is in the Bible, how it applies to our daily living. Then when we go home to our communities, how do we live the life? How do we live? Just like a student that comes to class. Hmm. You take classes. Yeah. You get evaluated. You get assessed. Then you graduate. Hmm. An employer comes to hire you. What is he looking for? For you to apply mm. all that knowledge you acquired in school Amen. all these years to do what? Productive work. Yes. Not to come and destroy their company. No. I have a private company. In addition to my work at the CDC, I have a private clinical company. But I don't go to hire you if I know that what you are going to do is to what? Destroy the company. <laughs> I have let a lot of people go that do not have the interest of the company attacked. So that's what he's saying here. Yes. If you continue, persist in their wicked ways, right? When that judgment comes, there'll be what? There'll be vengeance. So we've been warned. We've been warned. See, I think the problem is, I think it's natural for us to want to think of God's vengeance as coming from anger. But God is love. So we have to reconcile how does vengeance and love coexist? Mm -hmm. And does that mean something different than what I expect? Because God is not coming with, with, with anger. Mm -mm. Um, so his vengeance is different than mine would be. No, no. Um, I don't understand it. Mm. But it's not a vindictive vengeance. It's, it's not, not vindictive. It's not, it, it's a purifying vengeance. It's a, yes. it, it is for the benefit of the others that he loves. Mm. To, to, you know, it's part of that cleansing. I mean, do we want Satan tormenting us and accusing us forever? No. Or do we want God to end that someday, permanently? And I think that vengeance is him ending that torment for us permanently, giving us peace from that, from, from the, not, I mean, the sin is being cleansed out of our hearts if we allow it, but the peace of removing the temptation, removing the accusations, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. removing all of the filth, that Satan has put on this world. Yep. Okay. The, our time is up. My brother, give us our closing prayer so that we can assimilate all these good le lessons we've had. Our Father and our God, it's a deep privilege to be here. We ask that you forgive us of our sins and shortcomings. And Father, as we learn of your goodness and grace and glory and forgiveness, watch over us, protect us, and guide us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, everybody, for coming.